Welcome my dear friends, today we will have a nice lecture which included the updates of uh, endoscopy uh, and it will be, uh, inshallah, it will be useful for you. Today we will discuss the uh, basics of diagnostic of our endoscopy. We will begin with uh, this prayer. Allahumma akhir li warhamni wahdini wahdini warzuhni. Before you begin endoscopy, you should have these ideas in your mind to be a clever endoscopist. The first aim of endoscopy is not to harm the patients. So, if you want to do, don't harm your patient, you should be aware of the indication of endoscopy, the contraindications of endoscopy, and how to do the maneuver in a clever, in uh, how to do the uh, to do the maneuver in a right way. The second point you should learn that you should know when to begin and when to stop. That is to say, you should know the indications of the endoscopy, and you should know when to stop the maneuver when you think that the risks are more than the benefits. The third uh, wisdom is to stop is better than to continue and cause complication. And always remember Napoleon who said, I don't want to have two diseases, one natural and the second one caused by a doctor. Okay? If you put these wisdoms in your mind, you will be a clever endoscopist. You should know, uh, know that there are synonyms. Upper GIT endoscopy is the same as gastroscopy, is the same as esophageogastrodigenoscopy, EGD. They are the same synonyms. Okay? Uh, of course, uh, when we go back to the past, we should thank this Indian patient, this Indian man, who could swallow this sword. By swallowing this sword, he gave the idea to the recent endoscopy done nowadays. Okay. This slide shows the progress of endoscopy uh, years ago, and you can uh, read them in the literature if you want to know the history of endoscopy. What are the indications of you should know that we do endoscopy for multiple purposes. The first purpose is to diagnose a disease, okay? The second purpose is to assess the severity of a disease. The third purpose is to screen for a disease or to do surveillance for a disease. And the last three is to interfere to stop disease, okay? Because these are the common indications for endoscopy. To diagnose, what are the diseases which I should do endoscopy to diagnose them? They are various. For example, number one, if you have a patient with persistent abdominal symptoms and he didn't improve despite you gave him treatment, this is an indication. The same with if a patient has abdominal pain and alarm sign. Alarm signs, these are signs, red flags, that say to you there is something dangerous in this patient like malignancy. As for uh, GIT, it may be in the form of weight loss, upper GIT bleeding, lower GIT bleeding, and uh, continuous fever, for example. Dysphagia is an indication for endoscopy, especially if in old age patient, because there is high liability for the presence of cancer. Persistent unknown vomiting, the same. Persistent reflux symptoms despite the therapy, this is very important. Chronic iron deficiency anemia. Recently, the AGA has issued a guideline which recommended that patients with iron deficiency anemia should undergo dual EGD and colonoscopy. Of course, our GIT bleeding is an indication for the acoustic our endoscopy. You can use also our endoscopy to assess the disease. For example, in the caustic injury, we prefer to do endoscopy within 48 hours to assess the degree of necrosis for the tissues. And this will help you to know in the future you will need surgery or not 
there is high liability to the development of serious complications like structural fistulae and so on. Uh, of course, also any patient who will undergo any organ transplantation, liver, heart, lung, he should undergo diagnostic EGD, especially to detect ulcers because you know that during the operation and after the operation, the patient will take will uh, takes a lot of medications, including anticoagulant. Okay, this is very important. Also, before bariatric surgery, you should do endoscopy, and the recent guidelines recommend this because you may find congenital anomalies in your pathology which prevents the doing the surgery. If a patient who will undergo chronic NSAIDs, okay, use as rheumatoid arthritis, you should have baseline endoscopy, especially the presence of ulcer, and so with empty coagulation. Also, in the point of assessment, you should know that if you find a radiological event or radiological finding by CT, for example, uh, like cancer ulcer structure, okay, patient underwent CT, for example, for renal colic, and the CT said that there is query structure in the duodenum, here you will do endoscopy, okay, although the patient is asymptomatic. Endoscopy also can be used for screening. In a patient with liver cirrhosis, you know that if the platelet count is less than 150 and the fibroscan is more than 20 to 25 kilopascal, it is recommended to do screening endoscopy to detect viruses. Some guidelines prefer to do screening for parasitosophagus, especially in patients with long, uh, with long term reflux symptoms. And also, if you have a patient with familial adenomatous polyposis, it, it is better to do upper endoscopy, especially to assist the duodenum, because as you know, there is high incidence of cancer duodenum, especially arising from the babella. And there is also high liability to the presence of gastric polyposis. Endoscopy also can be done for surveillance. Surveillance is to detect the recurrence, okay? After, uh, for example, cancer resection, after bulbectomy, okay? And also for esophageal viruses return. Sometimes when you do multiple sessions of band ligation, because you don't, throw, you don't treat the exact etiology, you just do uh, surface or superficial intervention for the virus itself, it will return again. Interventions, of course, endoscopy can be done can be done for various diseases to interfere, like uh, hemostasis, removal of foreign bodies, dilatation of structural achalasia, stenting, bariatric, MR, ECD, feeding gastrostomy, and leak management, especially post bariatric. Uh, uh, there is a new concept is now uh, present in the literature. It is called intraoperative EGD or endolaparoscopy. Uh, simply, the surgeon can call you to do uh, intraoperative uh, EGD. This is very common nowadays. And uh, there are various indications for this. Number one is uh, localization of the disease or a neoplasm. Sometimes you describe that there is an ulcer in the pulp, for example, or in the second part of the helium, and the patient case is critical, so the patient the uh, surgeon asks you to do endoscopy during the operation and to fix the light against the ulcer so he can know the exact site of the ulcer and do over suturing the right. Sometimes that the neoplasm is not, uh, especially if this intraduminal is not obvious for the surgeon, he will ask you to do the same. This is localization. Also, if you have a patient with Dulafoy ulcer, of course, as you know that in Dulafoy ulcer, if you find a case of Dulafoy ulcer, you should apply a clip beside the Dulafoy lesion or to do ink jet, uh, ink, uh, jet black injection to uh, notify the surgeon the possible site of the blood vessel, especially that there is high liability for bleeding, okay? If you didn't do so and the patient has uncontrolled bleeding, you will under you will do intraoperative EGD to, to try to localize the site of the artery itself. During the resection for tumor, sometimes the endoscopist will ask you to do endoscopy to assess the resection margin, and uh, also in some uh, gast early gastric neoplasia, the endoscopist may uh, the surgeon may call you to uh, help him. Okay, so this is new concept. 
And this new concept helped us also in another new point that there is by doing intraoperative EGD with surgical backup, actually there is no more contraindication for endoscopy. There are no contraindication for endoscopy with such concept. Uh, you know that when you do endoscopy for a patient and you inject uh, air, the stomach, for example, will distend this, distend this, distend this to a certain limit because the anterior abdominal wall will prevent further extension. That's right. But uh, during operation, when the abdomen is open and you continue to inject air, the organ will enlarge, 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 distend, 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 till it may rupture. So it is better when doing intraoperative EGD is to use minimal insufflation or to use carbon dioxide in sufflation. Uh, this is a nice study, as you see in this nice study. Uh, in this table, you find that there are the types of the endoscopes which can be used intraoperatively, and I want you to know that nowadays there are surgeons which are uh, learning endoscopy to do intraoperative EGD instead of calling the uh, endoscopists. So the gastroscope, you can use it in the oesophageogastric surgery, in myotomy, pantoplication, weight loss procedure, enteral access. Duodenoscope, you can access the duodenum transoral, and it can access also the duodenum huh, transabdominally to do ERCB, especially if there is gastric or dental obstruction, for example. The adult endoscope, uh, uh, it can be used, of course, to do colon resection and the rectal resection. That's right. And it will be done trans a trans -ana. That's right. So there is trans oral route. This is a known route for the endoscopist. But during the operation, you can do the endoscopy trans abdominally or trans nasal. In this center, this is these are the common indications for the intraabdominal uh, for the uh, endolaparoscopy, uh, GERD, esophageal diverticuli, fistulae. Uh, Osophageal tumors, as you see, gastric tumors, these are the most common indication. And this is a nice table in which you will find that the endoscopy done before the operation, it gave wrong diagnosis, and when it is done during the operation, it gives another different, different what, different diagnosis. For example, in this case, there is upside down stomach. When they did intraoperative, it was esophageal diverticulum. That's right. And uh, uh, under uh, under dysphagia, unclear dysphagia, it was esophageal and hypopharyngeal tumor. Gastric guest, it was esophageal cyst. There, it was esophageal intramural tumor. Okay. So uh, it is useful. Actually, it is very very useful. Okay. Another case, it was esophageal tumor. Here, intraoperatively, it was tumor of the cardiac. Okay. What are the indications of endoscope? When to avoid doing endoscopy? There are three concepts which should be put in your mind. It may be the endoscopy is not appropriate. Okay. Maybe the risk is more than the benefit, or doing endoscopy will not change the plan of management, and it may be contra. Uh, these are from the ASG, the American Society of Gastroenterology Endoscopy. Okay, not appropriate if you have functional GRT symptoms. The yield of the endoscope will be zero, so no need to do such thing. Uh, metastatic adenocarcinoma of unknown primary site. This is very important. If you find a radiological finding of asymptomatic hiatal hernia, asymptomatic deformed duodenal pulp responding to therapy, uncomplicated duodenal ulcer, what is the benefit of endoscope here? You will not change the plan of treatment. Maybe the risk is more than the benefit, like bleeding for aborted duodenal fistula. As you know, that if you faulty touch the fistula, it will rupture, and in table this way is the role. Non-responsive hypovolemic shock, the patient will die even if you did endoscopy, so avoid endoscopy, okay? Advanced cardiopulmonary disease, also you will not increase the uh, survival of the patient, and at the same time, endoscopy may cause um, uh, some side effects like arrhythmia. Zinc or diverticulum, it should be done by expert endoscopist, thoracic aortic aneurysm. Complete contraindication, yes, if there is absence of consent, you should not do endoscopy for a patient without an informed written A 
consent. This is very important. Sometimes the patient is not cooperative, especially if doing endoscopy without sedation or with local sedation. And if the patient is not cooperative, he may harm you and harm the endoscope itself. Okay. Uh, I remember a case. Uh, the patient was very, very strong, and he tried to pull out the endoscope from his mouth while catching the endoscope uh, shaft because he is very strong. He uh, pressed uh, markedly on the shaft, so uh, <laughs> the shaft uh, turned into a paper. Okay, very, very thin part. Of course, endoscope, no more use. Uh, perforation is a contraindication for endoscopy, as you know. In adequate fasting in a Calisian gastric outlet obstruction, because if the patient didn't fast for at least 24 hours, there is high risk of aspiration and the pneumonia. The patient will not die from a Calisia, but he will die from from what from pneumonia. What are the complications of uh, endoscopy? Uh, you should put in your mind the following wisdom. Diagnostic EGD is a safe procedure. Diagnostic EGD is a safe procedure. Okay. Now we will come to each point alone. Sometimes the patient may complain of sore throat and abdominal discomfort from the injection of water or injection of gases to distend the stomach, of course. So throat uh, tell the patient that it will last a few days, of course and it will resolve this spontaneously or he can gargle with water mixed with uh, mixed with salt okay uh, local anesthesia spray it may cause a serious uh, side effect which is called methemoglobinemia and uh, in methemoglobinemia during endoscopy you will find that the oxygen saturation is more than 95 but the patient get cyanosed got get cyanosed Sedation most uh, complications during diagnostic endoscopy is attributed to sedation and anesthesia. This is known. Uh, especially the cardiopulmonary adverse effects, hypotension from the anesthesia, apnea, uh, desaturation, and something like this. So for endoscopists, you should give sedation to SA1, yeah, SA1 and SA2. Uh, if the patient is more than SA2 or SA2, you should a uh, you call uh, any uh, Of course, there are risk factors for the problems of sedation, like the pre existing cardiovascular disease, advanced age, ACA 3 to 4. Cardia, sometimes you may have uh, tachycardia, okay, due to stress, anxiety from the patient, it may reach to sinus tachycardia. Sometimes there is repolarization abnormalities in ischemic heart patient, but most of them are transient. Perforation is a rare event which may occur in one up to 11,000. Okay, uh, the most common site for perforation is the hypopharynx and the duodenum and the solidus, which, which are narrow, and you may uh, use force to, to negotiate to pass through them. There are risk factors for the perforation, like anterior cervical osteophytes, which narrow with the human, as we will know later. Zinc or the verticulum is a common cause of esophageal perforation because you don't know the true human. Also, vagal structure, if you try to transverse it uh, strongly, malignancies of the upper GIT because the tissue is friable and so on. Bleeding is a rare event in diagnostic endoscopy. You can do diagnostic endoscopy up to bleed this more than. 20,000 okay, but if you will do biopsy or doing any intervention, it is better to have the little count more than 50,000. Okay, infections, uh, infection also it is not common with diagnostic upper endoscopy. Uh, and if you follow the good sterilization protocol and the reprocessing protocol, the risk of infection is very, very low. Okay. Uh, in the past, one of the most common source of infection is uh, the water bottles. They were source of infection of pseudomonas. Okay, bacteremia is very rare to occur, but you have to uh, to put in your mind that you should give antibiotics before doing endoscopy for two diseases: liver cirrhosis and uh, gastrostomy tube to try to avoid bacteremia. Of course, the procedure can cause uh, uh, can cause complication. 
and it is beyond the scope of this lecture, okay? Uh, you should also know that the concept of contraindication is challenging and changing because intraoperative endolaparoscopy solves a lot of problems. If you have any case which is contraindicated, you can do it intraoperatively safely, okay? Uh, you, we said in the previous lecture that perforation is contraindication for endoscopy, but nowadays perforation can be treated by endoscopy, okay? By ovisco capsule, by stent, by suturing, endosuturing, okay? Uh, I have a nice case. Um, uh, a young man, uh, his wedding uh, is after seven days, and his, uh, his wife, uh, said to him, you are obese, you should uh, do weight loss. He went to a doctor and underwent uh, endoscopic balloon fixation, okay, intragastric balloon, but he uh, filled it with uh, 700 milliliters. Uh, unfortunately, the balloon compressed the stomach and caused the uh, duodenal ulcer and the perforation within five days. The patient came to war with perforated who is perforated the stomach. The surgeon called for removal of the balloon to do suturing for the, uh, for doing the suturing for the ulcer. After removal of the balloon, Ovesco capsule was, was applied and no surgery was done. So the concept of contraindication is changing and challenging. And another point, don't obey <laughs> your wife. All was in everything. Patient preparation. Uh, the American Society of Gastroenterology uh, Endoscopy said that if you have a young man and he is uh, healthy and he has no evidence of any disease, there is no need to do investigation for him. Uh, especially if you are doing endoscopy with local sedation. But if your plan is to do endoscopy with sedation, of course, we should do investigations like X-ray, uh, serology, uh, liver function, INR, renal function, and CBC, because you may find a contraindication for sedition, okay? It is better that any female, uh, especially if she will undergo endoscopy with anesthesia, or she will undergo fluoroscopy, for example, like uh, dilatation of any structure, I can use something like this, it's better to do pregnancy test, except if she gave you a history of menopause, hysterectomy, or bilateral tubal ligation, okay? If the patient is suspected to have a problem in the coagulation, or he is on anticoagulant, okay, uh, you should do coagulation profile before. Also, if the patient has new respiratory symptoms or decompensated heart failure, you should do endoscopy. Before endoscopy, you should do X-ray. Also, it is recommended to do blood typing and screening before endoscopy when a blood transfusion is considered in patient with active bleeding or anemia. Uh, if there is also history of pre-existing anemia or ongoing bleeding or there is high risk of significant blood loss during the maneuver, it is better to do CBC before. Uh, we suggest also that selective chemistry testing before endoscopy in patients with significant endocrine renal hepatic dysfunction. This is very important for the sedation and also to uh, manage the patient in a more safe uh, maneuver. Uh, fasting. The, as you know, that the patient should be fasting before uh, endoscopy. It is better to be within six to eight hours but suppose that you have a patient with hypoglycemia if there's long fasting you will undergo in uh, hypoglycemic attacks so at least four hours for fluids and six hours for food prolonged fasting with IV fluids is recommended for acaresia and gastric liver obstruction of course before doing endoscopy you should have informed signed consent and you have told your patient what is the nature of the procedure, what are the benefits, what are the risks, what are the safe alternatives, okay, and what are the limitations of the procedure. Time out before procedure, this is very important. Before touching your patient with the endoscope, you should revise the indication for, you should revise the name of the patient, his file number, 
the indication for the endoscope, the requested endoscope. A lot of errors occur. Sometimes the patient is requested for going, for undergoing uh, upper endoscopy, and in fact, he, he, he was by mistake prepared for colonoscopy, and it's common mistake. Okay, local anesthesia, you will give the patient local anesthesia before the maneuver to prevent the gag reflex. And we said that the benzocaine it may cause methemoglobinemia, but the cocaine didn't cause such uh, complication. In some uh, centers, they prefer to give anti foaming agent like Ronase, like Astralstein, and Simonspone, and it is a common practice in Japan. Regarding antibiotics, we said that the incidence of bacteremia is very low, but we should give antibiotics before uh, doing endoscopy in patients with liver cirrhosis or they will undergo percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tube placement. How to do endoscopy? I want you to know that endoscopy is not only examination of the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum, but also it is examination for the oral cavity and the hypopharynx. Because a lot of endoscopists neglect this point. No, you should examine the oral cavity and you should examine the larynx. A lot of cases came with upper GIT bleeding and they were hypopharyngeal cancer, but the endoscopist entered the esophagus blindly, so he did not notice the uh, tumor. Uh, as you know that ARCV, we enter the esophagus uh, during ARCV blindly. Uh, a few years ago, I did a case, uh, uh, I did ARCV for a patient, and after I finished uh, stent fixation, I noticed that there is blood coming to the duodenum from the stomach. Uh, I pulled out the endoscope and I tried to see the uh, source of bleeding, but I could not you know, identify it. I brought uh, our endoscope and uh, and I began to do our endoscope for the patient. I found that there is mass in the surface, but as you know, that uh, the ARCB or the duodenoscope is uh, side viewing endoscope and he can examine only one fourth of the field, so we didn't see the tumor during negotiating the esophagus. Uh, what is the best position for the patient during endoscopy? There is a standard position and we have alternative position. The standard position, as we see in this image, that the patient, he should lie in his left lateral position, okay? His right arm above his body and the cannula is present here to can to make it easy for the nurse to give fluids and to give anesthesia. Okay. His left arm is, flex, is, uh, is flexed at the elbow joint like this. Both knees are flexed. Okay. So the anterior abdominal wall is, uh, is not uh, rigid and it allows expansion of the organ. Another position, you can extend the lower leg and the upper leg, you can uh, flex it. Of course, the patient should have comfortable clothing. Of course, this is very important. And you can make here wear uh, gown, loose gown before the maneuver. Okay, you will put in his nose, nasal bronchus to give him oxygen, whatever you will use sedation or not. And also, if the patient is under mechanical ventilation, the endotracheal tube balloon will prevent you from negotiation. So, just so you should deflate it. If the patient extends this here lower left arm, it will be bothering, it will bother the endoscopist. So, this is wrong position, okay? There are alternative positions like the supine position, like in this image and like in this patient here. When to do supine position? When the patient can't lie on his left side due to hemiplegia, quadriplegia, and during the fixation of big tube, you, the patient should be supine. Also, uh, the patient should be in the prone position, okay? In the prone position, it can you can use it during the gastric outlet obstruction to compress the anterior abdominal wall and preventing lobing of the endoscope, okay? 
and during the uh, 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 and during the esophageal stent fixation also the patient lies on his abdomen so you can put a radiological mark on a on his back elevated bed heading or sleep setting it can be used of course if you are doing a diagnostic endoscope and you have to inject a lot of water in the stomach the patient uh, the water it can come out from the esophagus or from the esophagus to the larynx and aspiration will occur so the patient should be in 45 degree okay same setting position sometimes when there is a case of bleeding and you want to examine the fundus for the presence of fundal viruses and there is a lot of blood you may make may you may make the patient in a semi sitting position so the blood by gravity descends and you can examine the fundus well okay the endoscopist in colonoscopy okay as you know that there may be one endoscopist or two endoscopists one man uh, the main one and the second one is assistant okay in our endoscopy it is better to be one man okay the endoscopist may do endoscopy while he is standing like in this picture and while he is sitting on a chair like this okay in this type he will be very rapid okay and it is very convenient for the endoscopist but this position for the endoscopist it can be done when you are doing a lot of number of examinations in a short time, if the endoscopist is a female and is pregnant, or you have a strain in your legs, okay? And there is a nice case in the literature that there is a doctor which had quadriplegia and he continued his work uh, to do endoscopy on a chair like this. What are the components of the endoscope? Endos the component of the endoscope, there is a head of endoscope, like in this picture, which is called the control section. There is connection, which connects the endoscope to the unit. And there is the body or the shaft of the endoscope, and its distal part is called the tip. It's called the tip. If we look for the head, we will try to know uh, its components. The lower button here, which is uh, which is having a blow mark here, it is used for injection of air and injection of water, water irrigation. If you just touch this button and you don't press it, air instead of getting out from this orifice, it will get out from the distal tip and extend this your our inflates your uh, inflates the patient's stomach. Okay. If you press this button, you will inject water and it will come out from the tip, mix it with air, okay? This one, which has a red mark here, it is used for the suction. If you press it, then the scope will suction any fluid or water, okay? These buttons, black one, are different from endoscope to endoscope. They are multifunctional and the programmer of the endoscope will uh, tell you when to use them, but generally this one is used to freeze the screen to take images, okay? This lever is used as a lock. When you move it, it will prevent this large wheel, this large dial from moving, okay? So it is a break for the large wheel. This lever, which is present laterally here, it is also a break, it is also a break or it prevents the movement of this uh, small wheel or small dial, okay? Okay. The large wheel or the large dial you see here, it can be used to deflect the tip of the endoscope up or down, okay? If you, uh, if you pull this uh, dial towards your body, you will do up on the screen. You will, the bizar will go up on the screen. If you push it away from your body, the endoscope tip will go down on the screen, okay? The small wheel here, if you pull the screen towards your body clockwise, it will cause the endoscope to go to the right side. And if you push the wheel away from your body and clockwise, it will, uh, it will, uh, it will push the tip uh, towards the left.
okay here it is r the function this head is connected by a line this line which is called the connection line and the connection bar it is connected to the unit okay the body and the shaft you will have marks on it as you see here to tell you how much the endoscope has advanced within the patient all this shaft is not mobile but the distal 10 centimeters is flexible and can mobile or it can move in various organs right left up and down and even retrofiction as we will discuss later what are the types of endoscopes uh, we have uh, three types of our gastroscopes the first one is the ultrasound ultrasound you will find that it is very thin it has the same diameter of nasogastric tube okay so you can use it transnasally or trans orally it does not require sedation because it is very thin and it is comfortable for the patient just like right tube okay before you fix a right you will not give sedation for the patient it has multiple benefits the first one it does not need sedation so you can use it in a patient with advanced cardiopulmonary disease if the patient has congenital anomalies in his mouth like this patient in this photo you can do endoscopy transnasally this is a patient with cerebral palsy i did transnasal endoscopy for him okay if you have a visual structure it can pass through the structure to take biopsies from the structure itself and it can uh, measure the distance of the uh, structure so it's very very useful but you should know that it has some limitations the quality of the image is low and uh, its support is very thin so you will not get good biopsies with it okay the standard in the scope is nine millimeter in the diameter and it has a channel which reaches from two to three point eight channel the double channel it has two channels and it is very useful in patients with upper GIT bleeding because through a channel you will you will push your accessories like the sclerocerapy needle uh, uh, the clip and so on and through the other channel you can suck any uh, secretion in the stomach uh, but uh, it's a drawback that it is very thick okay so it is uh, more uh, bother uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, bothering to the patient okay and it will annoy him especially if you don't use sedation but also it is useful in uh, in another point what is the other point you should know what is the diameter of your channel to know what is the proper what are the proper accessories to pass through suppose that you have a patient with visual structure and you want to fix a metallic stent no metallic stent it requires a large diameter channel so you can fix it by double channel only or through a colonoscope usually the endoscope lens is averaging from uh, one meter to one meter ten centimeters what are the movements can be done with endoscope we come to a very important point the first movement we are doing with endoscope is to push forward and pull backward. Logically, I will push the endoscope to go through the esophagus and to go to the stomach, and I will pull it out when I finish the nobar. Okay. What we mean here by this movement when you have a gastric loop, when you have a gastric loop. In patient with gastric outlet obstruction or G-shaped stomach, okay, or patient with obesity, sometimes the endoscope have a big loop in the stomach and it prevents you from negotiating the duodenal orifice. So in such a condition, I have to repeat the endoscope clockwise and pull it back to the cardia and aspirate all the air in the stomach and try to push forward again okay tip deflection uh, you uh, you know that the image you see on the screen is the uh, is the mirror image of uh, the movement of your endoscope shaft and tip so when I say a movement 
it means the movement you will see on the screen, not actually the movement done by the endoscope. Okay, okay. So the movement on the screen are the following: number one, to push or to push the endoscope to the right, to push the endoscope to the left, to push the endoscope to uh, upwards, to push the endoscope downwards. Okay, again, to push the endoscope to the right, to push the endoscope to the left, to push it upwards, to push it downwards. Okay. These are the main movements, and there is another movement which is called retroflexion. How to do these movements? The standard method for doing uh, these movements is by the use of the large wheel, the large dial, and the small dial. And if you see, uh, as you see here on this image, that there are letters on uh, letters and arrows on the wheels in this small one there is our arrow if you push the wheel or the dial away from your body according to this direction of this arrow you will have right movement on the screen and the opposite and so on okay so i can get right and left by using the small dial the up and the down, it can be done by the A, by this large dial. And as you see, there are arrows on them to help you if you forgot. If you forgot. What are the movements and how can I do them? You know that the weapon is very important for the soldier. And the soldier should not miss his weapon and he should not lose his weapon the same for the endoscope you should take care of the patient and you take uh, to take care of the endoscope as a machine you should conserve it you should avoid tears to it okay we don't want the endoscope to be to be broken down because a lot of patient will lose the service okay if you use the dials a lot, unfortunately, the wires inside the endoscope will tear and it will need maintenance. Maintenance is very expensive. So, I will say to you now, I will try to teach you how to avoid using these wheels. Okay? Number one. <clears throat> Look to this slide. <clears throat> the most common uh, uh, movement used during endoscopy is movement toward the right or toward the left. Okay? I will catch the shaft or the body of the endoscope 20 centimeters from the distal tip here. While catching it, try to rotate the shaft clockwise and try to rotate the shaft anti-clockwise, okay? And look to the screen. Don't look to this endoscope, look to the screen. If you rotate the endoscope clockwise, the endoscope in your screen will be directed rightwards. If I twist, if I torque the endoscope anti-clockwise, you will find that on the screen, the endoscope will go to the left. This is the first movement to avoid using the dials. Okay. The second movement is through wrist flexion. If you flex your wrist, the endoscope will go to the right. If you extend your wrist, the endoscope will go to the left. Okay. The third movement is by using the elbow. Okay. If you do elbow flexion like here, the endoscope will go to the right. If you extend your elbow, the endoscope will go to the left. The last type of movement is by using the body twisting. Fix your legs and try to twist your trunk. If you move like this clockwise, by twisting your body toward the right, the endoscope will go to the right. And if you do the opposite, the endoscope will go to the left on the screen. If these are the main movements, and by catching the endoscope in such way and doing these movements in such way, 
you will not use completely the right left wheel. Okay, so you will keep your endoscope intact and you will preserve it. You will preserve it. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, before using endoscope, you should check your uh, endoscope. Like before going to a journey, you will have to check the radiator, the oil in the engine, and so on. The same. I should check air. Just press this button, and air will come out. Like uh, you will see bubbles here. Press it to see water comes out, of course. And try to suck this water. There is here black. Uh, there is here blue water. Now the scope sucked it in a, in a good manner. Never go to the inside of the patient without testing your endoscope. This is a crime. How to catch to grab your endoscope? Okay. In the left hand, the left hand will catches the head of the endoscope okay in this in such way but the head uh, of the endoscope make it sleeps on your left bulb okay the thumb it will moves up and down the large wheel like this and the index and the middle finger as you see the index will braces the suction button and the middle finger will braces uh, the air uh, water button like this okay you should catch the shaft of the scope 20 centimeters 15 to 20 centimeters from the tip if you catch the scope too early here close to the tip you will not manipulate your endoscope easily it will be difficult for the endoscope if you catch it away from the tip the endoscope will do co will do lobing it will bend this outside the mouse and this is wrong okay okay you can catch the endoscope or grip the endoscope close to the tip but it will not the tip here it will be close to the mouth of the patient when you try to negotiate to pass through a spastic pyloric orifice only okay before getting in through the mouse you should check your endoscope as you see, this bottle is not fixed to the connector of the endoscope. You will pull the endoscope to inside the esophagus. Why the esophagus does not a distend? Oh, there is no air. This is wrong. Of course, you should check your sedation plan. You will use local anesthesia or conscious sedation. You should do time out. We have said this before. You have to check the endoscope at its functions. And of course, check the position of the patient. Look for the brightness, okay? It should be around zero. Check that the lamp is on, okay? And check the level of the air, low, medium, high. This is very important. And check the position of the patient. This patient, we have said that the lower arm, it should be flexed at the elbow, okay? So when you do endoscopy, it will annoy you check that the endoscope connector is connected to the unit if it is not pressed uh, and you didn't uh, uh, hear the tack uh, you will find that you will have no air or no and you will have black image okay how to go through the mouse to the pharynx this is very important we know that you can do endoscopic endoscopy under vision or you can do it blindly uh, during the learning of endoscopy most uh, most endoscopists uh, prefer to do intubation blindly because it is more easy uh, the mechanism is very easy just do up by the large wheel uh, up what is meaning by up you will push the large wheel towards your body and clockwise uh, push the endoscope till you see the uvula then go down with the wheel away and gentle pressure you will be in the surface 
actually it is not preferred because you may miss a lot of pathology in the throat. But it can be used during US, can be used during uh, ERTB because ERCB, as you know, is a side viewing inclusion score. So it is better always to do in the, uh, vision, to have vision, especially if you are suspecting some pathology like zinc or diverticulum or malignancies in the throat. How to do good intubation for the oral cavity and the pharynx? You should, on the screen, make the tongue like here is between one o'clock and eleven o'clock, like in this picture, or between nine and one o'clock. But the lower one is the preferred one for me. Okay, I will push the endoscope gently over the tongue till I reach the uvula. Don't touch the uvula because if you touch the uvula, gag reflex will Okay. Never, never, never use injection of air or water in the mouth or the hypopharynx because it will cause aspiration and it will cause gagging. So, don't put your middle finger over the air water button. Remove it. We don't want cough. Or gag. I will put the tongue on the screen uh, in the upper part of the screen as in these images I will push the shaft gently till I see the uvula I will not touch it once I reach the uvula I have to go to its right or its left but we don't use the right left wheel we will try to preserve our endoscope so just do clockwise rotation or anti-clockwise rotation to pass beside the uvula okay once you have passed the uvula do downward movement okay do downward movement and you will see the IO pharynx when you go in the mouse if you see this is a soft palate okay this is a soft palate and this is the tongue as you know, that the image in the screen is opposite to the trough. So there is a raffi here. In the soft palate, there is a raffi. It tells you the direction of the endoscope. So always follow this raffi. In this image, the endoscopist didn't follow the raffi, but he will touch the toes and to cause this leak for the endoscope. When we go to the hypopharynx, we will see the vocal cords. Okay. Okay. If we look to the most important uh, landmarks in the hypopharynx is the vocal cord. You know that this is the vocal cord, this one, and uh, this fold is called the vestibular fold. The lumen here is the trachea, and you can see here its rings. The most important landmark for you is the four sugar pills. One, two, three, four. The cuneiform tubercle and the corniculate tubercle. This fossa or this pocket which is present here is called the biriform fossa. We have said in the previous slide that you should not inject water or inject air in the hypopharynx because it will cause a spasm here in the vocal cord and also you should avoid popping to the trachea because it will cause a choking where is the esophagus you need you see this this is limb actually this is the upper esophageal sphincter which is compressed by the vocal cord i should push the shaft of the endoscope in the midline and with gentle pressure, push the endoscope in this slim behind the four tubercles. 
Just gentle pressure and ask the patient to swallow. The endoscope will go through the upper esophageal sphincter, which is called the red out. You will find the screen is suddenly red. Here you should press the uh, water button. Uh, I'm sorry, you have to touch the uh, air water button to inject the air and to distend the esophagus. You should avoid this by reforming fossa because if you try to push the endoscope here, it may cause fistula to the skin, and it is a serious complication. Uh, some authors, but uh, it is not common, they say to you that you should push the endoscope to the lateral part of this limb behind the lateral tubercle. Then you have to do clockwise rotation or anti-clockwise rotation according to you use the, the right part or the left part to navigate through the ossicles. But I prefer that you push your endoscope behind the four tubercles. Okay? Sometimes you may have difficulty in negotiating the upper esophageal sphincter, especially, especially if the patient is suffering from Parkinsonism. In such condition, you may need to give more sedation, and it is better to use propofol to relax the muscle. If you have difficulty in passing the, through the upper esophageal sphincter, sometimes the endoscope forms a loop outside the patient which prevents the forward progression of the endoscope in a right way and as a result of the loop, instead of going against the upper esophageal sphincter, it will slip to the trachea here. So, to solve this problem, simply elevate the, your left head, elevate your left hand to be parallel to your head. Okay. Always avoid the pyriform fossa or the pyriform recess. This is a case in which there is perforation here in the pyriform fossa. Uh, actually, if you read the case report, you will find that the endoscopist uh, uses the uh, AUS and uh, he entered the blindly, so by error, pyriform fossa injury occurred. Sometimes, especially if there is a loop outside the body or there is Parkinsonism or there is air hypersensitivity, which causes uh, extension of the focal cordis and more over compression of the upper esophageal sphincter. You will jump into the trachea. You can identify it by the rinkis and by the division of the bronchi. Here you see that this is cervical spondylosis. There are osteophytes from the vertebrae, which causes bulging here in the hypopharynx, so the endoscope will be challenging. And touching this area, it may cause uh, a tear in the vertebrae. This is a case of uh, zincar diverticulum. This is that, uh, the false pocket. I entered by endoscope to this false pocket, which was blind, so I retracted or pulled the endoscope gradually uh, backward till I, put and, uh, till I could identify the our esophageal sphincter. One of the problems we face sometimes during endoscopy is that there is retroflexion of the endoscope. The endoscope, of, instead of going down, it goes up to the nose. And it occurs when you, there is doping outside the patient mouth, or there is hypersensitive airway, or the patient is aggressive, which uh, so he prevents the swallowing of the endoscope. So instead, the endoscope jumps up. So, so because, uh, you when we revise the anatomy of the esophagus. You should know that it begins about 15 centimeters from the incisor, there is the upper esophageal sphincter, and it ends 40 centimeters from the incisor uh, where there is a lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, there is a cervical part which is very narrow, and uh, sometimes we don't examine it, it well because it is narrow. Uh, but you should examine it because it is a common site for the tracheoesophageal fistula and for the inlet patch. Okay, a typical uh, or hydrogen hydrotropic uh, gastric mucosa. Then there is the thoracic oesophagus. The thoracic oesophagus it has impression on it uh, due to the compression of the aorta, the atrium, the bronchi, and of course there is the abdominal part of the oesophagus which creates lateral. Uh, in the endoscope, you have to inject water. You have to inject water. This is the oesophagus, and these are the impressions of the blood vessels. 
This is the view of the lower part, which there is the lower esophageal sphincter, and this is the Z line. The Z line it can be identified by the irregular mucosa here, and you can identify it by the formation of what is called the longitudinal mucosal folds, one fold, two fold, three fold, four fold. Here is a technical point I should say to you. The endoscope uh, or the esophagus, it does not go downwards to the stomach straightly. No, there is areas of curves. So if you push your endoscope straightly, you will at last uh, face the right wall of the esophagus. To keep straight in the esophagus and within the lumen, the middle of the lumen, while I push the endoscope through the esophagus, I have to extend my left elbow. I have to extend my left elbow, so the head of the endoscope, which is parallel to my axilla, will go down gradually till it parallels my pelvis. By this maneuver, you will not use the right left wheel to correct the directions. As you see, this is the standard position for the endoscope. The head is parallel my left axilla. I gradually extend my elbow. So at the last, you will find that the head of the endoscope is parallel to my uh, barrier to my hip or barrier to my pelvis. By this maneuver, you will not use the right left wheel. What are the components of the stomach? As you know. Pandas, cardia, body, greater feature, receptive feature, the incisora, the antrum, the pylorus, the bulb, and the genium superius. Type. How can I go from the esophagus to the stomach? As you are driving, you should follow the traffic signals. If I drive uh, my car and I see these arrows, I will know that this road is curved towards the towards the towards the left or to, I'm sorry towards the right. I should follow also the signals in the stomach. When I want to pass through the lower esophageal sphincter, the lower esophageal sphincter actually is deviating to the left. Okay. To pass through it in a good manner, to pass through the cardia, when you are facing the cardia, simply rotate the shaft of the endoscope anticlockwise with gentle pressure. You will pass through the cardia easily without injury. This is the first technical. When I pass through the cardia, I will see fluid in the stomach. This fluid it indicates the junction of the fundus and the body. I have to suck all the fluids to prevent the aspiration. Okay. Then I will inject it. And I will follow these rugi. These rugi are turning to the right. So I have to push the endoscope and turn it to the right. How to turn it to the right? Don't tell me that you will use the right left wheel. This is wrong. What to do? Remember. When I reach it to the end of the endoscope, to the end of the gas of the esophagus, I had full extension of my elbow. I had full extension for my elbow. So I will push the endoscope gently with gradual flexion of my elbow to the neutral position again. By this technique, you will find that your endoscope will rotate to the right gradually and no wheels will be used. So, I will advance my endoscope till these rugi begin to disappear like this. This is the beginning of the antrum. This is the beginning of the antrum. To reach the pyloric ring, I have to push the endoscope with simple, simple or trivial upward movement. Okay, so I will push the endoscope with trivial upward movement. So the endoscope will go, go, go. To, well, I'm sorry, the endoscope will go to the pyloric ring simply, okay? When I am in the front of the pyloric ring, I should make the pyloric ring in the center of the screen. 
with gentle pressure, with gentle pressure, I can negotiate it, and then there will be red out. The red out because I entered the bulb and I am stuck to the mucosa. Simply withdraw the endoscope few millimeters and insufflate air. Okay. If you have difficulty in intubation of the pyloric ring, I have to uh, behave. I will tell you later. After examination of the uh, antrum, I should pull the endoscope gradually till I see the incisora. The incisora is generally present at 50 centimeters from the incisor and you should keep this distance in your mind. Okay. Here I should do maximum up deflection okay, of the scope. At the, at the same time, before doing pushing or pulling out, I will extend my elbow suddenly. Again, when I reach the incisor, I will make full upward deflection and the maximum extension for my elbow. By this technique, you will see a pocket beside the incisor, which when it injects with air, it will guide you to the fundus. It will guide you to the fundus. And gradually pull out the endoscope. And gradually pull out the endoscope, like here. Here, when I tried to uh, do retroflexion, I made full extension for my elbow. I uh, here as in this book, this is the full extension, and this is the full. Uh, uh, this is the full flexion. Okay, I will tell you when to use this. Even now, when I am, I will get to the next slide better. Give here. At 50 centimeters from the incisors, when I am facing the incisor, I will make maximum up and full extension for my elbow, and I will begin to pull out the endoscope. You will see the fundus like in this photo. Okay. When I see the fundus in light in this photo, I will try to flex my elbow gradually till I have this view which is called the fundus proper. This is the greater curvature, this is the laser curvature, and this is the shaft of the endoscope. I have to rotate the endoscope 180 degree to examine this area of the laser curvature behind the scope because maybe there is a dual lesion or an ulcer. How can I do this? Simply. When I began to do examination of the fundus, I have full flexion of my left elbow. When I did flexion of my elbow to the neutral position, you will have this view for the fundus. If you continue flexing your elbow and making the head of the endoscope parallel to your right axilla, you will have the view behind the endoscope. You will have the view behind the endoscope. Like this, you here I began to examine the fundus. Then I examined the fundus in the neutral position to get the fundus proper. Then I flexed completely the elbow so the head of the endoscope is parallel to my right axilla, so I can see what is behind the shaft in the uh, in the fundus. After you have examined the fundus in a good way, simply Pull the endoscope while it is retroflected, okay? Pull the endoscope inside the patient so you can see the fundus away, but you can examine the greater curvature in a good way and the incisora also in a good way, and this is called the panorama view. Here, as you see, I am seeing the pyloric ring. I retract my endoscope. Both, so I saw the incisora, or if you don't saw it at 50 centimeters from the incisor, I did maximum flexion of the endoscope with full extension of my elbow. I began to withdraw the endoscope gradually uh, till I saw the fundus proper. 
Uh, now we come again to the incubation of the duodenum. I said that to incubate the uh, duodenum in a good way, uh, the distance from the incisor it should range from 60 to 70. If you are facing the pyloric ring and the distance is more than uh, 60 or 70, this means that you did a large loop in the stomach and it is common with obesity gastric lid or obstruction and G-shaped stomach. Here, you should correct this loop because you can't navigate through the duodenum. Just do torque clockwise and pull out the endoscope with gradual suction of air. When you get inside the bulb, spread out it will occur because you will you will be against this area. Just pull a few millimeters and inject air. If you failed to negotiate the pyloric ring, sometimes you should expect to have ulcer behind it causing edema and spasm of the muscle. Here you should try to, uh, to do intubation one, two, three, four times and always keeping the orifice of the duodenum in the center of your screen. If you failed, there is an, uh, a simple uh, technique, but I don't prefer it, to push a biopsy forceps out of the scope one centimeter to make it go make it go through the uh, duodenum and the both the endoscope fix it to it but i don't prefer this point because if you are not expert you may cause perforation uh, second part of the duodenum you can to go to it uh, with vision you we always go to it blindly because there is acute angle here as you see to go to the second part of the duodenum, there are two techniques. The first technique is simply go to the area which is suspected the entry for the second part and do gradually maximum up and the maximum right. With injection of air, you will see the second part of the duodenum here in which you will find that the G are circular. The second method is simply uh, Make the head of the do full flexion for your left elbow and make the head of the endoscope parallel to the right axilla with gradual up and both the endoscope. This is the same, okay? Sometimes when you go to the second part and you try to pull the endoscope to go deep, you will not have this movement. This means that there is a loop in the stomach. Here you do clockwise rotation and pull the endoscope out. On the screen, you will find that they are going deeper. Okay, this is uh, this this correlate with uh, this correlates with the presence of a loop. Uh, so you may see the major papilla, and sometimes you can't see it. This is not the. Uh, this is the endoscope here. When the endoscope gets to the stomach, it can't see this part of the fundus. It is blind for the endoscope. The endoscope it advances till it reaches the pyloric ring. Okay, here it examines the duodenum. This is a loop. You have to correct the loop by pulling out with clockwise rotation. Then you have to do retroflexion for the endoscope to see the unexamined part of the fundus. If you examine here, you should do rotation 180 to examine the area behind the shaft. These photos, this is the upper third of the oesophagus, the middle third, the lower third, and these are the mucosal fold, and this is the Z line. Of course, this is the hypopharynx, and the most important landmark for us are the four tubercles, and we know that the upper oesophageal sphincter are behind the four tubercles. This is the stomach, okay? Uh, this cartoon is, it shows you how what is the position and how and what will you see in the image, okay? Because the image is the reverse of the truss. The same here. The same, this is a retroflexion. Another new point in this lecture, uh, I want to present it to you. What are the direction and the orientations during the diagnostic of our endoscopy? <laughs>
in those figures suppose you have a clock on the screen the eight o'clock it represents the anterior the three o'clock it represents the posterior of the esophagus the six o'clock it represents the left of the esophagus and the twelve o'clock it represents the right if you want to keep them in your mind pretend that you are saying the head of the patient while he is in the left lateral position you will find that these are the same directions okay anterior posterior right left these are also when you reach the z line these are the quadrant the right quadrant the left quadrant the anterior quadrant and the posterior quadrant even this these are the quadrants you will ask me what is the importance of directions i will tell you now the first one for the quadrants if you are injecting the vitamin for uh, treatment of akinesia especially if the patient has advanced cardiovascular disease you should know what are the quadrants because you will inject the four aliquots here okay if you have a patient with polytrauma and suppose that there is a polyp entered the endoscope the surgeon will, will ask you what is the direction of the bullet so he can know where to open where to open should he open to the right of the esophagus or to the left of the esophagus so in advanced centers knowing the directions during endoscopy is mandatory when we go to the stomach the anterior and the posterior will be the same the anterior and the posterior will be the same but the right, which is the upward of the screen, it will be the lesser curvature, and the bottom of the screen, it will be the greater curvature. These directions are very important. If you pick, if you fix a gastrostomy tube, you should push your needle from the skin towards the anterior wall of the stomach. So you have to keep your endoscope away or injury by the needle to the endoscope well okay so knowing the direction is mandatory here in such manner these are the photos of the stomach they are the same anterior posterior right in the esophagus will be supplanted by left left or lesser curvature even here anterior posterior the upper part of the screen it will be the lesser curvature and the lower part of the screen it will be the greater curvature it will be the greater curvature and we said that the directions are very important especially during the fixation of a gastrostomy tube what are what is about the uh, directions in the duodenal part um, when i uh, prepared this lecture i looked for this question in multiple endoscopy box but I did not find an answer. I didn't find an answer. Um, one year ago, I did the endoscopy for a patient with massive upper joint bleeding. And I said, in my report, that the ulcer is present in the posterior wall at uh, the junction of the first and second part. But the surgeon, after the surgery ended, told me that the location was wrong. And I insisted that I was right, and he insisted also in this on his opinion. I searched for the answer for this question in books, but I didn't find. During the preparation for this uh, lecture, I found this, the answer in only one published paper in 1992 you know that when you enter the bulb you will find that there is fluid in the upper part of the screen which represents the inferior part or the most dependent part of the tube. in this study they found that only 30 percent of the cases there will there was a correlation or a good a good location of the ulcer document or the same location of the ulcer with uh, the location of the ulcer was the same uh, determined by endoscopy and by laparoscopy 30% only 30% of 70% of the cases there was no correlation between endoscopy and true laparoscopy 
This doctor, which is called Strucker, tried to solve this problem. He said, when you find any lesion in the epidemic, simply after you fix the examination, make the patient in the supine position and inject water in the epidemic, the area in which the water stagnates, it will be the true uh, posterior wall of the duodenum. It will be the true posterior wall of the duodenum, and so you can give precise location for the uh, surgeon. Really, I admire this study so much because I faced this problem many times. When we are doing endoscopy, sometimes the patient eructates the gases and the eructates air from his stomach and it makes the distensibility of the stomach is this so you can't examine it well. The bleaching during endoscopy is very annoying to the endoscopist and it makes you uh, unsatisfactory for the maneuver. I searched for this question, why bleaching may occur during endoscopy. My personal experience causes when I searched for a possible etiology, it made metazolam induced in some patients. And if you did the liver biopsy before, when I was doing a liver biopsy for many patients, when once I give the metazolam, hiccups begins to occur. Hiccups begin to occur. So it is midazolam induced. I searched in the side effect of midazolam and I found that it may cause irritation or hiccups. Some patients have exaggerated fundal effects. If you are drinking a can of Pepsi rapidly, you will irritate huh, carbon dioxide from your stomach. That's right. This is a physiological effect. The fundus can extend, extend, extend. Distend, distend, distend to a certain point to prevent its rupture. It makes a sudden relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter to allow gas to get out. If the patient is anxious, okay, or have underlying psychiatric problems, this reflex is exaggerated. So during endoscopy, he will irritate air. The presence of hiatal hernia makes the lower esophageal sphincter floppy, so air it will come. If there is fundal fluid or bile, if there is fundal fluid or bile, of course, uh, uh, it will cause the irritation because bile is irritant to the lower of the sphincter. I tried to solve this problem by elevation the head of the bed by minimal air and supplation. Sometimes I distend the fundus with water, but while the patient is 45 degrees, of course, baclofen before endoscopy or propofol, it relaxes the fundus and it prevents the irritation. Uh, during the preparation also of this lecture, I tried to search for this point and I found that there is only one study uh, all, over the way, all over the world published addressing this point by Lee et al. Uh, in uh, 2016. He found that most patients uh, who have bleaching during endoscopy and in his study he didn't use sedation, just local sedation, they were having here central obesity, they were young males. And even if there is no gear by manometry and VH manometry, he found that patient had nerve. So he concluded in the end of his study that bleaching during endoscopy is a side of reflux. Now we come to a new point, which is the which are the quality indicators. When you are doing endoscopy for medical legal purposes. You should have photos for your uh, work, okay? You should take three photos for the esophagus, the proximal esophagus, the distal esophagus, and the line here. In the stomach, you will you should have a photo for the cardia. While uh, there is retroflexion, this is the fundus. You should have a photo for the corpus. This is a lesser feature, and this is a greater feature. You should have corpus in retroflexion, including the greater feature, which is here. You have a photo for the incisora. This is the antrum. This is the bulk. This is the second part. 
and additionally if you see the babilla you can take photo for it if a quality it advises taking at least 10 photos which is called photo documentation now uh, we will compare the following guidelines for uh, quality metrics we will come to the first point is before commencing the procedure the ESG it recommended fasting to be two hours for liquids and six hours for food the EGA recommended number one the indication it should be appropriate you should have informed consent before the mover you should revise the history and the examination of the patient you should have a risk uh, a risk of adverse effects okay and the documentation of them in the consent give antibiotics when necessary so roses and the beet uh, you should uh, plan the uh, sedation how to give and you should document them you should document the management of the antithrombotic agent but usually during uh, diagnostic endoscopy you will not uh, stop any anticoagulant or antiplatelet the, uh, the endoscopist should be competent he should be excellent clever to doing endoscope the British society yani, it agrees with the AGA and uh, the Asian the same the use of mucolytics it was only recommended by the British Society of, the, of Gastroenterology and it was also recommended by the Asian consensus. The sedation to use local anesthesia or moderate sedation, the ECG it didn't uh, give uh, uh, recommendation. The AGA it recommended to do with sedation. The British recommended when sedation is required, especially if the patient is anxious. And the Asian, they recommended sedation. So the only one who didn't recommend the sedation is the European Society of Gastrointestinal Industry. What is the definition of competence? It is not defined here, not defined with the EGA, but the British said that before doing a diagnostic upper endoscopy, you should be trained on at least once 100 EGD per year. Okay. The procedure time, you should take at least seven minutes examination. This is recommended by the European Society. The AGA didn't recommend time. The British also recommended at least seven minutes. And there will be procedure time documentation in Paris, Osobidas, and pre-malignant lesions. The Asian one recommended what? Recommended eight minutes. Eight minutes. Photo documentation is recommended by the European, British, and Asian consensus, but the AGA did not find solid recommendation here. This is the biopsy protocol, how to take biopsy if you are doing a diagnostic upper endoscopy. They also addressed if there is imaging technique like Logol's uh, chromo endoscopy for suspected squamous neoplasia. This is recommended by the SG. The AGA didn't recommend imaging enhancing techniques. The British recommended local chromo endoscopy for suspected squamous cell carcinoma, and the Asian recommended them uh, to detect neoplasia. To detect neoplasia. Uh, also, registration of the complication uh, it is recommended to to, uh, to document if adverse effect occurred during the maneuver or after. It. These are the quality metrics uh, proposed by four different societies. Also, you should classification during endoscopy, like for example, Paris classification for neoplastic lesion, Los Angeles classification for esophagitis, Zargar classification for caustic esophagitis, Babino classification for uh, viruses, Hill classification for hiatus hernia. It is also recommended by quality metrics. These are the sites of biopsies for isomophilic oesophagitis, this uh, green color. I will take from the proximal oesophagus, the distant oesophagus. For parrot oesophagus, I will take one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, four quadrants, each one two centimeters apart, like this, and one from this tongue. 
in pre malignant stomach sydney protocol you have to take two from the antrum one from the incisora and the two from the gastric body in celiac disease you have to take one biopsy from the first part of the duodenum and three one from the second part of the duodenum uh, these are the recommended references and now we will shift to some videos uh, two videos by me showing you the movement of the endoscope and I apologize that they are in Arabic and I could not put uh, subtitles for them but you will understand them from the movement and the two uh, free uh, videos from the literature okay. هنيجي احنا خلصنا المحاضرة بتاعتنا هنيجي لمرحلة الفيديوز آه ان شاء الله انا جايب اتنين فيديو تعليمي من مواقع اجنبية آه آه تعليمية وفي اتنين في تلات فيديوهات ليا فيديو انا بشرح الموفمنت معلش انا بعتذر من الصوت كان سيء لصعوبة في التسجيل لان انا ما عنديش كاميرا تسجيل انا بعتمد على الموبايل آه وفي آه حالة منظار ليا برضو انا مصورها كده باي كلام يعني لكن الحالة ديت الميزة الوحيدة اللي أنا عاوز أشوفها فيها اللي هو في أنا كان عندي مشكلة في الانتيوبيشن بتاعة الأمر وسبجيريس فيكتور نتيجة كود ستيكريشن فديت أنا حاططها عشان حالة ظريفة هتشوف إن أنا عندي شفاط الفلويد اللي موجود في الفندس وأنا داخل ومع ما قلبت المنظار لقيت في فلويد عملت سنة داون عشان أشفط فده هيكون برضو ظريف آه يعني الفيديوهات اتفرجوا عليها بقى براحتكم يعني المحاضرة أنا حاولت أجيب فيها كل المشاكل اللي قابلتني في حياتي في الأبر اندوسكوبي عشان كم حاولت ان انا ادور في الليتريتشر اشوف يا ترى الخبره الشخصيه هل في حد نشر فيها ولا لا بحيث ان احنا نستفيد اسال الله العليم قدير ان هي تفيدكم وان انتم تفيدوا المرضى بتاعتكم وان شاء الله خير باذن الله وجزاكم الله عنا كل خير. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ده المنظار بتاعنا اللي هو الفيديو بتاعنا اللي هو الشاف بتاع المنظار ده اللي هو بيخش فيه العيان دايما لما بتيجي تمسكه بتمسكه على بعد 30 سم من الحد بتاعهم من شين 30 سم ديت الحد بتاع المنظار وده عباره عن الانفراد الفوق بتاعي بتاع المنظار اللي هو بيوصل بيه البروفيسور عشان يجيب لك الايه الحد اللي في الصوره خالص. يهمني جدا ان انت تبقى عارف ايه هي مكونات المنظار هنا وديت بتختلف من منظار لمنظار. أول حاجة الوحدة اللي إحنا شايفينها تحت ده عبارة عن بورد مسؤول إن أنت ممكن تعمل منه تدخل الأكسسوارز بتاعتك خلاص كده اتفقنا زي الإنجكشن مثلا ستيرو سيرب نيدل أو الفورسيبس أو أي مكان في الحاجة اللي أنت هتستخدمها ولازم أن تبقى عارف الدايمتر بتاعها قد إيه علشان الأدوات بتاعتك اللي هتخش إيه يعني أنت لو هتركب مثلا حاجة زي ستيل في سوفيكس مش هينفع يخش في المنظار ده ده محتاج إن التشانل دي تكون واسعة لازم تبقى عارف برضه المنظار بتاع الدايمتر بتاعه قد ايه المنظار ده 9 ملي خلاص كده اتفقنا بي 1 شانل فور ساكشن خلاص كده اتفقنا فده بيستخدم في حالات الدايكوستيك وممكن في حالات النزيف انما انا لو عندي حاله محتاجه انترفينشن جامد يفضل الدبل اتشانل عندي هنا في زراير كتيره زي ما احنا شايفين اول حاجه في عندنا البقره الصغيره ديت ديت بنسميها البقره بيسموها بالانجليزي دايل خلاص كده اتفقنا فديت مسؤوله ان المنظار بتاعي بيجيب رايت وليفت البقره الكبيره ديت ديت برضه دايل او البيت دايل ديت مسؤوله عن ان هي بتجيب الاب والداون في عندك قطعتين زياده بيكونوا موجودين عندنا في المنظار دول بيسموهم اللوك انك تقفل بيه لو انا عملت مثلا لوك كده هتلاقي ان البقره ديت ما بتتحركش معاك ايه بسهوله لو انت حركتها جامد انت بتكسرها خلاص كده اتفقنا يبقى ده عندنا الايه اللوك في هنا زراير زي ما انتم شايفين اهي الزرار اللي تحت ده ده دي فايدتين اثنين في نفس الوقت لو انا اتكيت عليه تكه بسيطه كده هتحس ان الاير بيضرب في صباعك وانت جاي تتك عليه فبيخلي الاير اللي هو طبيعي جاي في الشانل بتاع المنظار يطلع من المنظار فتقدر تعمل بيه ايه تقدر تعمل بيه انسبشن لو انا اتكيت عليه متواصل هتلاقي المنظار بتاعك ابتدى يطلع ميه علشان تعمل بيها ايه؟ ووش يبقى ده بمنظار الاير بيدخل الاير وفي نفس الوقت بيعمل موتر اريجيشن. الزرار اللي فوق ده ده بتاع السكشن خلاص؟ 
لو انا التاكيد عليه كده هيعمل لك سكشن دي اي في زراير تانية بتكون موجودة عندك فوق ديت بتختلف من منظار لمنظار على حسب البروسيسور بتاعك ممكن تعمل فريز الصورة تعمل بيها كابشر ممكن تكون فيها حاجة زي مثلا النارو باندنج والحاجات ديت فديت بتختلف من منظار لمنظار على حسب نوع المنظار اللي انت بتستخدمه خلاص كده اتفقنا يبقى انا عندي البكرة الصغيرة الدايل ديت ديت بتجيب الرايت والليفت والبكرة الكبيرة بتجيب الاب والداون وده عندنا اللي هو اللوك بتاع البكر ودايما احنا ما بنستخدمش اللوك الا في الانترفينشن بس لما تيجي تستلم المنظار بتاعك المنظار زي السلاح عند العسكري لازم تحافظ عليه زي عينيك عشان ده قبل ايش اهم حاجة بمسكه ازاي اول حاجة المنظار بتاعك يكون ممسوك بشكل حرفي عليه علشان الانفكشن كنترول تعرف تتحكم فيه اوعى تخش في العليان الا لما تتاكد ان المنظار بتاعك شغال كويس ان اللان بتاعتك لازم تكون منوره علشان تشوف جوه في ناس كبيره بتخش بالمنظار وتكتشف ان اللان مش عايده تاني حاجه ان انا لازم اجرب الاير واجرب الغوطه خلاص انا اتفقنا قبل ما اخش لان الغلط انك تخش في العليان وتكتشف ان اليوم بتاعك ما بيفتحش وتكتشف ببساطه جدا جدا ان الاير مش شغال لازم اعمل سكشن كويس يبقى انا لازم اكون اتاكد من منظاري قبل ما اخش طبعا لو انت عندك خاصيه البرنتر والحاجات دي لازم تتاكد ان البرنتر تكون شغاله معاك كويس او الفيديو كابشر يكون شغال معاك كويس. اي منظار لما نيجي نشوفه هتلاقي ان الجزء الاولاني ده اللي هو في لغايه العلامه ده ده هو الجزء اللي بيحصل فيه الموفمنت ده الجزء اللي بيحصل فيه الموفمنت يمين شمال اي حاجه لكن الجزء اللي بعده ده شاف عادي ما فيهوش اي حاجه. خلاص كده اتفقنا؟ طيب نيجي نشوف احنا بنقدر نحرك يمين وشمال ازاي؟ المنظار ده من جواه في وايرز حبال زي الحبال بتاعت لعبه العجله بتاعت زمان كنا بنلعبها زمان فانا لما بعمل بقره كده الحبل هنا من هنا بيقصر فيقوم التب ايه تيجي يمين او تيجي معايا شمال. طيب اهم حاجه اعرفها ايه هي انواع الحركه اللي انا اقدر اعملها للمنظار وتفيد العيان بتاعي. ازاي انا بعمل ايه الحركات اللي احنا بنعملها؟ اول حركه عندنا في المنظار از بوش اند وزرو بوش اند وزرو ايه الفكره؟ ان انا كل ما بفك المنظار لجوه كل ما بيحصل له ادفانس في اليون بتاعي. طب الوزرو هو بستخدمها في حاجتين اثنين وانا خارج من المنظار طبعا مفيش مشكله او لو انا دخلت في المنظار وضربت في الميكوزه فحصل عندي حاجه اسمها ريد اوت يعني الدنيا بتحرك وتشايف حاجه يبقى لازم اسحب في المنظار بتاعي علشان ما يحصلش ريفرش يبقى دي اول حركه بنعرفها في المنظار. ثاني حركه عندنا في المنظار ان انا اجيب الرايت والليفت ودي مهمه جدا 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 لان انت لما بتخش من معده انت عاوز تمشي ورا الفوكس فلازم تعرف ازاي تبقى. طيب نشوف كده انواع الحركه اللي موجوده عندي في المنظار. اول نوع عندنا من الحركه ان انا اجيب الرايت والليفت عن طريق البكرة. اهو البكرة ديت لو انا دورتها بعيد عني يبقى انا هجيب رايت لو عملتها قريب مني دورتها قريب مني هجيب ليفت. خد بالك النقطة مهمة قوي ما تبصش في حركة المنظار تقول لي ده مش يمين وده شمال. احنا يهمنا اللي على الشاشة لان يعني الصورة على الشاشة بتكون مقلوبة. الصورة على الشاشة بتكون مقلوبة. لو انت بصيت هنا هتلاقي ان ادي الرايت بيقول لك حرك البكره بعيد عن جسمك اوي فروم يور بودي والليفت اهوت حرك البكره توردس يور بودي يبقى الرايت بعيد نفس الكلام الداون اوي فروم يور بودي لو انا جبت توردس ماي بودي يبقى ده بنسميه ايه اب يبقى هو البكر نفسه مرسوم عليه خلاص طيب يبقى انا اول طريقه ان انا اعمل كده خلاص اجيب الرايت والليفت عن طريق الويس ودي اللي بيستعملها كده ده الدكتور اللي هو مش شاطر. ليه؟ بنقول عليه مش شاطر؟ لانه بيهلك المنظار بسرعه، انت كده بتستهلك الوايرز اللي موجوده جوه بتزود معدل ان هي تتقطع معاك، فكده انت لو بتقص على المنظار. طيب اعمل يعني تجيب رايت وليفت ازاي؟ في الطريقه الثانيه للرايت والليفت ان احنا بنعمل حاجه اسمها بور، بور يعني تبرم. فانا لو عاوز اجيب يمين بضم ايدي كده كلوك وايز بضم ايدي كلوك وايز عاوز اجيب شمال بضم ايدي انتي كلوك وايز ده جوه العيان اثناء ان انت فعلا بتخش يمين وبتخش شمال 
خلاص كده اتفقنا فدي بنسميها حركه الدكتور ودي بنستخدمها في النافيجيشن من اللو اكسبيشال سبيكتر وفي دخول المعده والانترا وطبعا بنستخدمها جدا جدا في القلب يبقى اول حركه عندنا في البقره قلنا عن طريق الدايلز البقره قلنا ده مش مفضل انك تستخدمها كتير لانك بتبوظ المنظار بتاعك بسرعه تاني حاجه عندنا عن طريق الايه؟ عن طريق الطفل. في تالت حركه بتتنقل من المنظار عن طريق الشاف وعن طريق ايد الشمال. بص كده ايد الشمال. شايف؟ المنظار لوحده بيروح يمين وشمال، خلاص؟ يبقى ديت من الحاجات المهمه قوي ان انا ممكن اعمل منظار كده وكده، يبقى انا بستخدم الشاف بس فبطول العمر الافتراضي عندي ليه المنظار. وده اللي انا شخصيا بستخدمه. برضه ممكن تعمل بايديك كده خلاص؟ او ممكن تعمل بايدك كده. ازاي؟ برمي دراعي شمال يبقى انا كاتب ليفت، لو انا رميت دراعي لتحت يبقى انا بجيب ليفت، لو انا جبت دراعي من اقصى الشمال لاقصى اليمين ناحيه الرايت شوتر بتاعي كده انا بجيب رايت. يبقى انت ممكن تجيب عن طريق الريست تعتمد على الريست بس ده بيعمل لك بين بعد فتره. الحل الثاني ان انا برمي ايدي شمال خلاص اتفقنا؟ أو بجيب إيه من أقصى الشمال خالص إيه رايت شوتر يبقى ده تالت نوع من الحركة. هل في طريقة تانية إن إحنا نجيب بيها الرايت والليفت؟ أحياناً وأنت جاي تخش لما خاصة لما يكون الأنف المفتاح متغير ودي بتستخدم صوت طاولون أكتر بنحب نجيب الرايت إزاي؟ ساعات التوت نفسه مش كفاية ولو أنت عملت البقرة برضه مش كفاية. خاصة في الناس اللي بيكون عندهم المعدة بتاعتهم كبيرة نتيجة ان في جاستريك او تيت كونستراكشن او الكون. الرايت في طريقة سهلة بجيبه بيها ازاي؟ بجيب اب اهو وطول كل خالص. ده هيجيب لك ضربة عالية من الرايت. خلاص كده اتفقنا؟ يبقى اب ها اهو جبت البقرة ناحية جسمي وعملت طول كل خالص. خلاص؟ او لو عاوز اجيب شمال اب وانتي كل خالص. خلاص؟ عاوز تحجز بالداون لو انت بتحب تستخدم الداون عادي يبقى الداون انتي كلوك وايز هيجيب رايت، داون كلوك وايز هيجيب ايه؟ ليفت، ودي بنستخدمها في القولون من الحاجات المهمة جدا في الحركات بتاعة المنصات حاجة اسمها الريترو فليكشن. الريترو فليكشن يعني ايه؟ يعني ان انا بجيب ماكسيموم اب فالمنصات بيجيبوا على نفسه زي ما حضراتكم شايفين اهو عمل لك زي الهوكي ها عصايه الهوكي خلاص فده مستو ان انت بتقلب المنظار بتشوف حاجه مستخبيه لان المنظار ده فورورد فيوري زي الفندس او زي السيكم او زي الريكتور في نقطه مهمه قوي قوي ان انت لما بتيجي تحقن الفندر فاليسيس بتحقنه احيانا المناظير بتختلف على حسب السوق بتاعها وعلى حسب الصناعه بتاعتها وعلى حسب المنظار قديم او جديد لو المنظار جديد هتلاقي ان هو بيعمل بروتكشن حلو معاك كده خلاص أحيانا المناظير القديمة هتلاقي البروتكشن بتاعها كده فبجيب تحت الفندر فاليسيس هتلاقي إن في صعوبة خلاص اتفقنا؟ طيب أنا أزود البروتكشن إزاي؟ دي سهولة جدا خاصة لما بتستخدمه في الإبطال. دايما المنظار القديم جديد اعمل البروتكشن بطريقة سهلة أوي ماكسيمم أب وماكسيمم رايت. شوف هيحصل معايا إيه؟ الزاوية زادت جامد أوي. يبقى الماكسيمم أب والماكسيمم رايت بيزود لك الديجري بتاع البروتكشن فبيسهل لك حقن الدواري أو إنك تعمل البروتكشن في السيكا علشان تخش الاي سي كان فاز او تبرتم علشان تشوف الايه الفايرز بدون بين دي العين. يبقى ديت الانواع الرئيسيه عندنا دي في حاجات ثانيه بنعرفها من الخبره ازاي؟ في حاجه اسمها فيكسيشن للمنظار انك بتجبس المنظار بتاعك ازاي؟ ساعات انت بتحقن الفاندر فاليسيس بتلاقي المعده بتكون كبيره شويه فكل ما تيجي تتحرك بالمنظار يمين وشمال خاصه لما المنظار يكون طالع شويه فليكسبل ما بتعرفش تحقن كويس خلاص اتفقنا او ان لو واحد عنده مثلا جاسري او تيت اوبستراكشن المنظار بيعمل لوب خلاص اتفقنا او في بعض الحالات الاي او سي او في الكون طب بثبت المنظار بتاعي ازاي؟ ولا حاجه وانا شغال هي كده بجيب المنظار ما بين الصباعين واروح متاكد كده عليه وانا شغال يبقى انا عملت له فيكسيشن بالفينجرز بتاعي فالحركه بتاعت المنظار بتقل وده بيساعدك في فك اللوبس واللوكس يا جماعه بتتكون في المعده لو المعده كبيره او فيها اوبستراكشن او اذا كانت دي شيب اسكومر خلاص كده اتفقنا يبقى احنا كده قريبنا حركه جديده اللي اسمها حركه الايه؟ الفيكسيشن زي الفيكسيشن ده برضه بتتعمل في منظار القانون بعض الناس بتشتغل 
في هذا الفيكسيشن اللي النظام بتاعه عن طريق الطفل. طيب احنا كده عرفنا الحركات المهمه عن طريق الابر ميكروسكوب وعرفنا ازاي بنجيب ريتروفليكشن واستخداماته وازاي اقوم بالريتروفليكشن بتاعتي وعرفنا البون والبوش عرفنا ازاي اجيب رايت وليفت الدكتور خايف بيه البقره لا انا الدكتور مش خايف فهستخدم الرايت والليفت ومعايا حركه نفس الريست او حركه ايدي زي ما انا بعمل كده او تورك ذا شولدر في برضه حاجه اسمها البودي تورك ودي بعض الناس بتستخدمها لما تيجي تعمل باند رايجيشن تلاقي ان الدكتور بيرقص تلاقيه هو جاي يعمل باند رايجيشن تلاقيه كل شويه بيعمل جسمه كده فانت لما بتقعد تعمل جسمك كده ده برضه بيساعدك انك ايه تجيب النظام اليمين والشمال انت بتختار الطريقه اللي تفيد نفسك وتحاول تقلل الاصابات المنظمه معاك اللي هي ايه الارجوميكس من الحاجات المهمه قوي انك لازم تعرفها في النظام بتاعك ان المنظار ده زي ما قلت لك هو عامل زي سلاح العسكري لازم تحافظ عليه على قد ما اهم حاجه لما تلاقي فيه اوبستراكشن ما تعدلهاش بقوه لما تلاقي الدنيا احمرت معاك مره واحده يبقى انت ضارب في النفوذة او ضارب في المصر طيب اهم حاجه انك لازم تعرف طول المنظار بتاعك اي منظار ده طوله 110 سم اهو في مناظير بتكون اطول لازم تبقى عارف التشانل بتاعتك المقاس بتاعها ايه علشان لما تستخدم اكسسوارز زي البالونه مثلا او زي الاستنكات والحاجات اللي هي زي دي دي مهمه جدا جدا تبقى عارف زرار الايه وزرار السكشن بتاعك وجرب كل حاجه عشان تبقى عارف الكابشر بتاعك طيب انا دلوقتي خالي مفترض ان انا عندي منظار بس عاوز اقول حاجه فيه مهمه قوي بص حضرتك كده لو انا افترضت ان انا هجيب اب خلاص وهعمل ايد يمين وشمال كده اللي هو البودي موفمنت زي ما انتم شايفين. ايه رايكم في الاب والداون؟ او في الرايت والليفت؟ تلاقي الحركه قويه وواضحه خلاص؟ طب انا افترض ان انا هعمل المنظار بتاعي كده ورايت ويفت. اه برضه الحركه كويسه. لكن المنظار لو عامل لي بص الحركه ضعيفه. يبقى من الحاجات اللي هي بتقلل تقصير الموفمنت بتاعتك من ايديك او من جسمك للتب بتاع المنظار ان يكون عندك فيه هدوء. فدايما حافظ ان المنظار بتاعك يا اما يكون مفقود او على الاقل يكون يو شيب هيكون الحركه بتاعته احسن. طيب انا قدامي المريض نايم خلاص كده فانا هخش في السن. الدخول ده ليه طرفين اثنين. يا اما هخش في العيان بلاين اللي بنعملها دايما اول لما بنيجي نتدرب او لما نقول للدكتور اي اف سي خلاص كده فانا او بتخش اندر فيجن بتخش اندر فيجن تمام. انا افترض ان انا قصادي عيان هيجيلي بالطريقه بلاين. طريقة بلاين ازاي؟ ولا حاجة، بدي المنظار بتاعي ثانية صغيرة علشان يمشي معايا على الكيرف بتاع القمر، والعيان نايم أروح عامل المنظار بتاعي بحيث إن هو يكون ماشي على نص القمر بتاعه، وأروح زائد كده المنظار بتاعي وأقعد أحس الريزيستنس، أقوم أدي سن أب وأدق المنظار على طول، يبقى دي الطريقة الأولانية لإيه؟ البلاين. ودي طريقة سهلة وبتجيب نتائج عالية مع الناس كلها لأنها ما بتاخدش دقيقة واحدة والعيان ما بيلحقش يصمم منها ماشي. الطريقة الثانية البلاين إن أنا بدخل المنظار بتاعي ستريت من فوق الطاولة لبعض المجلة وأقول للعيان بول أب وأروح مدي أب زائد سنة هلاقي بيتها كورت أروح جاي داون وأروح إيه زائد يبقى دي الطريقة الثانية الإيه البلاين كل ده في البلاين إن أنا الطريقة الأولانية اللي هي الأسهل اللي هي عبارة عن إيه كيرف طبعا الأحسن اللي هو الأندر فيجن بس الأندر فيجن المتدرس في الأول بتكون صعبة شوية لكن هي الافضل على اساس لو في عندك باثولوجي في الاورو فاينت ماتس او اي حاجه في الفوكال كورت او لو انت عندك حاجه اسمها زينتر دايفيرتيكرام دي حاجه غير زي غير الاندر فيجن اللي بتشوفها لان انت بتخش في ساينس وبعد كده بتدور على اوبن متوصله في الاوسوكس. انا لما باجي اخش بالمنظار اهو اوكي بدي لون اهو بدي اربط الاول يبقى انا ماشي على الكيرف بتاع الطن وصل المنظار بتاعي للسوق لو حضرتك موصل من خليك مواصل للتاون هتلاقي ان المنظار بتاعك طالع لقدام ناحيه الايه؟ ناحيه الديفلوبس فعلشان كده بقيت سن اب يقوم انا المنظار يتفرد معايا ناحيه البوستيريور بول بتاع الفايز فيكون عندك الاوبننج بتاعك مين؟ بتاع الاسوس. طيب بخش ازاي؟ في مدرستين اثنين في مدرستين اثنين في مدرستين اثنين ليه الدخول المدرسة الأولانية اللي أنا بحبها هو دي اللي أنا ماشي عليها طول عمري ودي السيف أنا بأجي ورا الفوكال كورد بالظبط في الميد لاين وأروح زي المنظار بتاعي جنب الفشل دي ذا موست سيفست خلاص؟ 
في بعض الناس الثانيه بتحب ايه؟ بتيجي على يمين الميدلاين سواء يمين او شمال او شمال في الفايروتوروم فصه او ساينس وتروح زقه المنظار عليك وجايبه سنه رايت او سنه ليفت وتروح زقه. انت لو بتتدرب في الاول هتحب الفايروتوروم فصه خلاص؟ لكن عندها ايه؟ حضرتك لو ضغطت جامد هتعمل بيرفوشن عيان وهتعمل له ساينس للنك كارثه. الاسهل في الدخول والافضل والموست سيفست ان انا بخش من ورا الميدلاين. حضرتك الاصابه ده سلم بتاعته مش ستريت. الاصابه ده سلم ستريت بس هو مش نازل كده هو نازل بميل خلاص؟ فانت مجرد انك تخش الاصابه بس هتلاقي نفسك داخل وفجاه ضربت في الجول بتاعه. فجاه هتلاقي نفسك ضربت في الجول بتاعه. فتقوم تضطر حضرتك ايه؟ تجيب بالبقره ليفت علشان ما تمشيش في في الميدلاين بتاعت الايه؟ التيوب احنا قلنا استخدام البقره ده غلط. امال اعمل ايه؟ ولا حاجه. انا مجرد ان انا دخلت الاصول ده طبعا حضراتكم عارفين ان الابرا سوجيال سنتر بيكون موجود على بعد 20 سم من السايزرز بتاعت الايه؟ العيان ومجرد ان انا عديتها برمي ايدي شمال يبقى القاعده الاساسيه في الاصول ده ولا ما انت تخش في الاصول ده لما انا بعمل كده ارمي دراعك شمال بدون رايت ولا ليفت هتلاقي المنظار بتاعك ماشي في نص الاصول ده ايه؟ بالظبط. هتلاقي ان هو ماشي في نص الاصول ده ايه؟ بالظبط. فهخليني ماشي 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 خلاص وبدي جير ابتدي سنتين وصل الجير طبعا لغايه ما بوصل عند اللور اوسوجيال سفنكتر اللور اوسوجيال سفنكتر يا جماعه ما بتكونش نازله كده في المعده لا بتكون نازله في كيرف زي صباعي فعلشان اخش بيها لازم اعمل حاجه من حاجتين يا ادي سنه ليفت بالمنظار يا اما نعمل ايه ولا حاجه مجرد انك توصل عند اللور اوسوجيال سفنكتر هعمل تركي شمال تركي شمال ازاي؟ اخش شمال ازاي؟ انتي كروب وايز موفمنت فالمنظار ده ايرادي بدل ما هو بيكون ماشي كده بيقوم يحمل يقوم يعدي منك من اللور اوسوجيال سفنكتر بسهوله وهتلاقي نفسك وصلت لايه؟ للمعده خلاص؟ وده كده سيف. وده عامل كده اكتر في منظر الاكاديزي. طيب ومجرد ان انا دخلت من اللور اوسوجيال سفنكتر هتلاقي فيه فولد سكوشه وهتلاقي فيه فليب. الفلاول ده لازم تشخطه بالكامل وانت واقف، ليه بقى يا جماعه؟ كتير جدا لما حضرتك بتعمل منظار تلاقي العيان ارسل في المنظار كل شويه عمال يرفيت الجير كل شويه عاوز يشد المنظار كل شويه ايه متهيج معاه انت فاكر ان هو متهيج عشان قلب المنظار لا خالص قلب المنظار ده جزء اساسي مفيش مشكله لكن حضرتك لما بتدي جير في المنطقه دي حضرتك فتحت اللي هو اوكسجين سنتر بايه فلاقي راضي بيحصل باسيف ريفلكس فوق من ضغط الهواء السكريشنز دي عم بتوصل فوق لغايه الجارنس فبيجي له احساس بالاطمئنان كان انه داخل على اسبيريشن خد بالك ان النقطه دي مهمه جدا جدا فبتلاقي العيان بيتهيج معاك جامد جدا جدا خاصه لو كان الفلو ده بايل خاصه لو كان الفلو ده ايه بايل فعلشان كده لما توصل للنقطه دي اي فلو اللي عندك لازم تشفطه بالايه؟ اي فلو لازم تشفطه بالكامل الموضوع مش موضوع ايه خالص خلاص بقى اتفقنا انا شخصيا من انصار لما اجي اعمل انذار خلي العيان على زاويه 30 او 45 فبقلل احتكاك ان انا اعمل ريفلكس فالعيان يكون مستريح خاصه لو كان العيان بتاعنا عنده مشكله في الاير وي خلاص كده اتفقنا يبقى ليها نقطه مهمه قوي طيب ثاني نقطه من خبرتي انا الشخصيه احنا طبعا روتين بنكتب ان حضرتك دخلت اللور سوشيال جانكشن عند مسافه كام؟ عند 40 عند 80 اكشوال لما توصل عند اللور سوشيال سنتر لازم تقف على المنظار بتاعك وتبص انت واقف عند العلامه كام بالظبط؟ 40 38 42 ده مهم جدا 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 لو انت عاوز تبقى اندستريست شاط ليه؟ احيانا تبقى حضرتك داخل في امان الله عيان عنده سوشيال بانسيس فجاه الفيلد بقى كله فاضي حضرتك ما انتش شايف اي حاجه فمن طرق العلاج العلاج هذه الحالات خاصه لما يكون في اكتف سبيرتر انك تعمل بلاين بباند يعني طيب انا جاي جهاز الباند الدنيا كلها دم مش شايف كويس يا ترى انا هعمل باند من فين؟ الصح ان انت توصل لور سوجيال جانكشن او زي لاين وروح طالع سنتر 2 سم واعمل ايه؟ باندنج يمين شمال فوق تحت يبقى ده بلاين لو انا مش عارف من الاول انا لور سوجيال جانكشن بتاعتي فين او زي لاين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نقول ان الدكتور الشرف لازم يعرف لور سوجيال سنتر عشان
شمال ولا تدرج. ما هو برد أنا أعتقد كل بعمل إيه كده؟ شايف إنه جاب حصل فيه إيه؟ يبقى انا بعمل ايه كده وانا داخل هتلاقي ان انت ماشي بجرب الريح الفولز بتاعتك وانت بتدي ايه في المكان وسط الفول لغايه اما تخش الاندر. يهمني جدا تاني علامه دايما سبحان الله زي يعني ان عند 50 ها ده مكان الانسجرام هيفرق معاك ايه؟ عيان كريكتال وانت شايف ان في فاندر فارسس وانت عاوز تطور بسرعه ولا عيان عمال يرفيت ايه؟ اي عيان بيرفيت ايه؟ افحص الفولز قبل الاندر. ليه؟ لانه عنده حاجه اسمها اكزيجريتد فاندر ريفلكس، الجرد لما حضرتك بتحقنه بيعمل له ريديشن فيحصل ريفلكس دايريشن في الكارب فطبعا ايه؟ اعمل ايه؟ ولا حاجه انا دخلت بسرعه عند العلامه 50 اجيب ماكسيمم اب عشان اجيب الفاندرز واروح رامي بتاع شمال تاني، يبقى الفاندرز علشان تجيبه لازم الفيلم بتاعك ايه؟ شمال او لو ما بتحبش شمال في بعض الناس اللي هم ايه؟ بيتابعوا ملف يبقى الفاندرز فيه طريقتين اثنين علشان اجيبه يا اما الاب بتاع الشمال وده الاسهل ليك يا اما تجيبه من اقصى الشمال لاقصى الايه اليمين وما تديش ايه كتير حتى الفندق فتح معاك تشوف فيه حاجه ولا لا خلاص اتفقنا بس ده مش الايه مش العاده بتاعتي فانا بوصل لغايه الفيديو بتاعي بلاقي الاوبن بتاعتي بسبب الانتظار بتاعي واجي اعمل عليها جنت بريشر بخش بعد ما انا اخش جنت بريشر هلاقي ان حصل ايه ريك اوت لان انا ضغطت في الجزء بس بسحب بيني وادي ايه بخش السكند بارت ازاي ولا حاجه ماكسيموم اب ماكسيموم هاي فاحنا بزق المنظار اللي قدام انا مش بعمل ريفلكيشن ولا حاجه فدي سنه اب ورايت هتلاقي انك دخلت فيه السكند بار بتاعك. طب افرض ان انا مش عارف اجيب السكند بار اقف ادي هواء احمي الميه او افرض ان انا دخلت في السكند بار ولقيت ان المنظار ما بيخشش معايا كتير يبقى المنظار ساعتها فيه تورك هعمل تورك كويس ريفلكيشن واسحب لبره هتلاقي نفسك مش هتخرج من الفيديو نمبر هتلاقي نفسك بتخش في الفيديو نمبر دي ودي بنستخدمها في الجرس. خلاص كده اتفقنا؟ طبعا الفندق زي ما قلت لحضرتك عشان تجيبه بجيب ماكسيمم اب وبرمي دراعي الشمال او من اقصى الشمال لاقصى اليمين لما بتشوف الفندق حضرتك برضه بتعمل الحركه ديت علشان ايه حضرتك لما بتشوف الفندق بتمشي ايه اللي ورا الشاف بتاع المنظار فلازم تعمل الحركه ديت لان ببساطه شديده جدا ممكن يكون في تيومر ممكن يكون في ديولا بوي موجوده ورا المنظار او كامل رونديجن مش هتشوفها في الفندق كروبر العادي فعلشان كده لازم اجيب المنظار ايه يمين وشمال يبقى دي اهم الحركات اللي هي موجوده عندي اهم حاجتين عاوز تتعلمهم حاجتين دي في المصر اي فلو تشوفاته تعالى نجي له باسيف اسبيريشن بطريقه هي مع حته الانسيزيا دي نقطه مهمه جدا خاصه ان الفاينل اسوء شيء في الفاينل اكتر واحد بيجي له اسبيريشن لو حضرتك حقنت ميه في الاكسوبلس لو حضرتك حقنت ميه في الاكسوبلس في ميه كده تطلع لفوق على عكس ما انت تتخيل فبالتالي انا عايز الاسبيريشن يتهي معاك عشان كده لما تيجي تحقن المايه في الاكسوبلس لازم انا احقن على زاويه 45 درجه وبحقن كميات كبيره. اي ميه حضرتك تحقنها في المعده تشخطها تاني في نفس الوقت. وخد بالك التشخيط مش في الاندر بس لا ثلاث ارباع الميه اللي بترجع بقى الفندس فانت ما تاخدش بالك ان في ميه موجوده لا انا حقنت الميه على طول هذا الفندس ثاني حتى البريود موجود فيه عند الساعه 12 على الشاشه او اسف عن الساعه 6 شخطته بالكامل اهم حاجه تشخيط الايه؟ الفلس. دي الحركات الأساسية اللي أنا بيهمني إنك تكون عارفها في الانتصار ودي الحركات سهلة ملهاش أي مشاكل فكده دي يبقى إحنا عرفنا أساسيات الانتصار بتاعنا. خلاص كده. حاول تبدأ معانا واحدة واحدة كده. بسم الله. السكشن هياخدها مش شغال. خمس بس كده.
Ela adora banho, você acha não, pô? Cília. Ó. Ah. Do Cília. Anatomical Description Using Standard Upper Endoscopy In this video, we describe a standard upper endoscopy performed on a 50-year-old gentleman with a history of chronic gastroesophageal reflux disease and dyspepsia. We highlight basic endoscopic maneuvers performed during upper endoscopy and important anatomical landmarks. The objectives of this video are to review the common intubation and tissue sampling using biopsy forceps. Prior to the beginning of an upper endoscopy examination, a plastic bite block or mouthpiece should be inserted in the patient's mouth to avoid damage to the patient's teeth or the scope during the examination. Patient should be positioned recumbent in the left lateral decubitus position with the neck partially flexed. Once patient is comfortably positioned recumbent in the left lateral decubitus position with the neck partially flexed. Once patient is comfortably sedated, the endoscope is introduced into the mouth. It is advanced nimbly forward before bringing the large wheel of the control sound allowing downward curl of the wheel of the control sound allowing downward curl of the tip of the endoscope to pass above and behind the tongue epipharynx. The endoscopy should visualize the epiglottis and vocal cords. The scope should then be maneuvered forward and posteriorly pass the epiglottis to the upper esophageal sphincter. It is at the level of the thyroid cartilage, approximately 15-18 centimeters from the incisors. With application of gentle pressure and encephalation, the scope should easily pass beyond the upper esophageal sphincter into the esophagus. The esophagus is approximately 25 centimeters in length, and the esophagus should pay particular attention to the appearance of the mucosa for evidence of erythema, erosions, ulcerations, strictures, rings, web varices, or diverticula. For the purpose of this exam, we will examine the esophagus in more detail during scope withdrawal. Upon entry into the stomach, Particular attention should be paid to food debris for bodies or retained fluid. The endoscopist should suction any fluid in the fundus to improve visualization, but also reduce the risk of flux of contents into the esophagus, which may lead to aspiration. With gentle forward maneuvering, the scope should be advanced through the gastric antrum, the pylorus. Particular attention should be paid here for evidence of ulcers, erosions, and gastric central vascular ectasia. To enter the duodenal bulb, gentle forward movement should be applied. Typically, the inscript will create a loop in the greater curvature of the stomach while entering the pylorus, which is usually reduced at a later point in the procedure. Once beyond the duodenal bulb, the endoscopy needs to maneuver the scope through the duodenal sweep into the second portion of the duodenum. First, the scope is advanced towards the end of the duodenal bulb where the sweep is met. There, the endoscopist rotates their shoulder 45 degrees to the right, dials little wheel forward and big wheel back, and simultaneously pulls back the scope, resulting in paradoxical advance of the scope through the duodenal sweep and into the second part of the duodenum, where the circular duodenal folds are seen. The duodenal mucosa is examined for ulceration, erosions, or scalloped duodenal folds, which may indicate underlying celiac disease. If biopsies are indicated, the biopsy forceps can be guided into the working channel on the scope. Attention should be paid to the speed at which the endoscopist passes devices through the working channel as it is possible to damage the mucosa as the device enters the lumen. Once the endoscopist has identified the area to biopsy, the biopsy forceps can be opened, usually with the assistance of a second operator. The endoscopist can then advance the open biopsy forceps to the site of interest until they make contact with mucosa. At this point, the biopsy forceps are closed onto the mucosa and gently pulled back to obtain the sample. Some patients, the ampulla will be identified, but this is best evaluated 
fitted with a side view endoscope. Attention should be paid here to ampullary masses or periampullary diverticula. On withdrawal of the scope towards the stomach, careful attention should be paid to examination of the duodenal sweep. There is only limited visualization on initial entry. It is common to fall back into the stomach on withdrawal, but re-entry into the duodenum should be pursued if visualization was not adequate. It is imperative for the endoscopist to evaluate all portions of the stomach which can be facilitated through a retroflexion maneuver. The stomach should be distended with air and the endoscopist should advance the endoscope to the region of the angularis on the lesser curvature near the antrum. While simultaneously flexing the tip of the endoscope through dialing the large and small wheels in a downward direction to their maximal extent. Once in retroflex position, the endoscopist can use the small and large dials or torque the right and left hand to maneuver the endoscope to evaluate a 360 view of various anatomical marks, including the gastric incisura, gastric fundus, the gastric cardia, and gastroesophageal junction. Common pathologies seen on retroflexion include hiatal hernias, cavern erosions, and gastric varices. In similar fashion to duodenal biopsies, biopsies performed in the stomach can assist in the diagnosis of Helicobacter pylori in addition to looking for intestinal metaplasia. Narrowband imaging, an imaging technique in which light of specific blue and green wavelengths is used to enhance the detail of certain aspects of the surface of the mucosa, can be activated for further evaluation. Withdrawal of the endoscope towards the gastroesophageal junction Special attention should be paid towards the greater and lesser curvature of the stomach. Upon withdrawal into the esophagus, the gastroesophageal junction, found approximately 40 cm from the incisors, should be examined. Narrowband imaging can again be used for further evaluation of the esophageal mucosa. This can be especially useful for cases of suspected or established Barrett's esophagus. If esophageal biopsies are indicated, the biopsy forceps should again pass through the working channel of the endoscope. The tubular esophagus may be difficult to biopsy because the forceps may cut off the channel parallel to the wall of the esophagus. This problem can be solved by the turn-in technique in which the tip of the endoscope is turned to be more perpendicular to the wall of the esophagus through use of torque of either the right or left hand and may be augmented by suctioning of the mucosa into the biopsy forceps. Once the exam is complete, the scope can be withdrawn with gentle suctioning to decrease the risk of aspiration as the scope exits through the hypopharynx. Take home points. Left lateral cubitus is the optimal position for patients undergoing ED. Retroflexion of the endoscope allows visualization of the incisura, gastric fundus, gastric cardia, and GE junction providing valuable information to the endoscopist. To access the second part of the duodenum, the endoscopist should advance their scope, rotate their shoulder 45 degrees to the right, Move little wheel forward and big wheel back before reducing the scope and the allowing paradoxical movement into the second part of the duodenum. On withdrawal of the endoscope, air and secretions should be suctioned to reduce the risk of distension and aspiration. Now patient with epigastric pain. First, put the tip of the endoscope on the patient's tongue. Under direct vision, guide the scope through the mouth. You can see the uvula at the 6 o'clock position. When the epiglottis, the cricoarytenoid cartilage, and vocal cords appear, guide the tip of the instrument behind the cricoarytenoid cartilage and instruct the patient to swallow while you apply gentle pressure just to allow the cricopharyngeal sphincter to be passed. Advance the endoscope slowly to allow careful examination of the esophageal contour and mucosa. Examination of the esophagus ends with inspection of the gastroesophageal junction, with its level being determined in relation to the diaphragmatic hiatus. 
The red mucosal tongues at the gastroesophageal junction are highly suggestive of short Barrett's esophagus. Now advance the scope into the stomach and align the tip along the longitudinal axis of the stomach by means of a 60 to 90 degrees clockwise talking maneuver. There are certainly many ways of examining the stomach. The important point is to be both systematic and deliberate so as to minimize the amount of unexamined surface area. To this end, our approach in general is to observe the stomach in detail after, rather than before, the duodenum has been examined. So let us first move to the duodenum. The pylorus is examined closely, with particular attention being given to its motility during peristalsis. Now intubate the duodenal bulb by advancing the tip of the scope as closely as possible to the pyloric ring and then applying gentle pressure. At this stage, the patient may experience a little discomfort. Successful intubation results in a red-out appearance due to the tip of the instrument being applied closely to the mucosa of the anterior wall of the bulb. After the proximal bulb has been entered by the pyloric channel, stop and wait until sufficient air has been given to inflate the bulb. Inspection of the bulb is carried out using advancing and withdrawing movements. At this stage, the scope may often return into the gastric cavity. To overcome the sharp enteral angle and reach the vertical part of the duodenum, place the tip of the scope at the end of the bulb. Now angle the tip right and upward by turning the small wheel forward and the large wheel backwards and rotate the scope 90 degrees clockwise while gently advancing the scope. You usually find the papilla at the 11 to 1 o'clock position. After the duodenum has been completely examined, withdraw the scope and examine the stomach in detail. We start with the antrum. The antrum is recognized by the absence of longitudinal folds. Examination of the antrum begins with careful inspection of its entire distal portion, using arc-like talking movements. Within the gastric body, continue the arc-like movements until the junctional area between the body and the fundus is reached. This is recognized by the appearance of the gastric lake, which, due to the elevation of the patient's head, is seen in the distal fundus, just above its junction with the body. Once the upper gastric body is reached, we prepare examination of the cardia and fundic area by means of retroflexion. Deflect the tip upward and insert the endoscope blindly until the cardia and fundus are seen. Now withdraw the instrument in the retroflexed position for short distance while maintaining continuous air insufflation. We pull the tip of the endoscope inside this hernia and perform a 360 degree rotation, both clockwise and counterclockwise, to complete the retroflexed view. This maneuver allows close inspection of the short Barrett segment.
After examination of the cardia and fundus in retroflexion, return the endoscope tip to the original position in the upper body. Withdraw the endoscope with arc-like movements to examine the upper body and cardia. At the end of the procedure, before you withdraw the instrument from the stomach, always make sure to aspirate as much air and gastric components as possible to deflate the patient's abdomen. Back in the esophagus, we recommend withdrawing the endoscope slowly to allow, once more, careful inspection on the way out. I hope that the lecture was simple and useful for you and waiting your comments, inshallah.